It's really, really good to be back home. Uh, it's been a great journey. And uh, thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your support uh, for allowing us to be able to go and be an extension of Summit. Uh, I was at the Target Center. I, some of you were there. Uh, there was 12,000 people there. And I got to preach. It was kind of a dream come true. Um, but I wouldn't trade being here with you for 10 target centers. So I, uh, I'm, not, I'm, not saying, I'm not saying I wouldn't mind if we had 12,000 people. <laughs> but we'd need a bigger building. I don't know if you've ever played Uno before. But I love Uno. There's a couple card games. Hey, Xander. It's my son coming in late. Um, <laughs> me and Xander play Uno all the time. And, uh, or m one of my favorite card games is Spades. It's a really fun game. If you don't know that game, that game is a blast. But I've always noticed when my kids are playing Uno, this is Uno Zelda edition, by the way. And if you don't have this and you're a nerd like I am, you need to get this Zelda um, edition of Uno. It's actually really cool. There's a couple little spoiler alerts. I won't give them to you. But when I'm playing with my kids, I don't know if you're online and you've seen this or if you've ever played with someone. Have you, has anyone ever tried to pass off a six for a nine? <laughs> Have you? Guilty as charged, Xander's raising his hand. I can't tell you how many times I'm playing Uno with somebody and they're like, that's a nine. I go, that's not a nine, that's a six. No, it's a nine. Especially in the old ones before they figured out that you had to put the line underneath. So I need two people. Bill, can you come up here? And Kim, can you come up here real quick? Can you give a round of applause for the volunteers I just volunteered? <laughs> Careful, Bill. I don't want to take you to the hospital in Forest Lake. Good to see you, buddy. <laughs> Miss Kim, okay, I got a question for the two of you. Stand right where you're at, okay? Everybody can see what I have here, okay? And if you can't see where this is going, um, we need to chat later. But if I was going to ask you a question from your perspective, or from your perspective, what, what is that number? It looks like a nine. It looks like a nine. Bill, what, what's that number? Definitely a six. Definitely a six. And uh, can you give these two a round of applause? <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks so much for playing. The truth is, is they're uh, maybe both right, but what I want you to know as I kind of lay some foundation before we go to the word, everybody's got a perspective. Everybody is going to see things different. And maybe they're both right, but the truth is, is everybody's got a perspective and you need to know this second point as we build. If everyone's got a perspective, everyone lives with a perspective in their story. You have a narrative for your life. You have a story that you tell and that perspective lives in it. Many of you in this church have got a, a plot or um, you know, an overarching, if you will, type of story. Some of you are artists. I've met with many of you. You think like me, like a painter. You see, you know, um, Summit, not as this 1932, um, you know, church that was founded at Goodwill. It's like American Pickers Church Planning Edition. That's what you see. You're like the antique roadshow. You're like, okay, I can, if we just paint this, do a little, you see the value in some of these things. Um, some of you, are, honestly, I'll be very transparent, your, your narrative for your story, your perspective is you're a victim. And no matter what happens, no matter what I say, no matter how much I try and help you navigate, you're, you're a victim. Everyone's out to get you. You're never going to get past it. You're never going to forgive them or her. It's this mentality and it's plaguing your life. That's your story. Some of you are warriors. You got a you know, worthy battle to fight. I got a couple maintenance guys, Ben and John, that have come on board here at the church to help just the building, the facility, and 
who are doing an amazing job at YouTube University. Um, <laughs> or they call Bill Zemke and they ask him a bunch of questions. <laughs> but the truth is, is they think like warriors, like they got a sword in their hand. Some of you are hopeless romantics or you're full of hope and you're romantic. You're, you're this, everything's a love story. Some of you use sports metaphors with me continually. Pastor Eric, don't go where the puck is, go where it's gonna be. <laughs> okay, thank you. I, I appreciate that. I was just gonna order a sandwich. <laughs> you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. You know what I mean? Like, you think in sports narrative, that's your perspective, that's your story. Some of you are, are Republicans. And that's all you think about. <laughs> you send me these posts, like, like from Facebook, like I care about them. Um, some of you are Democrats, you know, and you think this certain way. And in political, you know, thought process where you're thinking in a narrative, I don't want to put people in groups and pin one to the other, but the truth is, is you're, you have a perspective and you could both be right. And your perspective is going to be carried into your story and your story has a narrative and so many of you have different narratives, different ways that you think, different ways that you see Summit, different ways that you see how where the church is at, where we're going and where we've been. All of this is coming together in a fulfillment of these plots. If life is a romance, you should be loved. If it's a battle, you're going to go fight for it. If it's a discovery, you're going to go and try and discover it's almost like the narrative or the story or your perspective gives way. So I have a question for you. What's your default way of thinking? What's your story? If I had to sum up mine, I think my story, when, the way I think about life is life is art. Life, life is a project, so make it art, more succinctly stated. Life's one big project, so make it count. Make it art. Make it something beautiful. Make it into something better. It's just kind of how I think. Now, I have a question about Summit's story or the story of Summit. I don't want to live in a small story for Summit. I don't want to dream little for this church. I don't want to think small. I don't want to think like Eric. I don't want to have my narrative in my mind. I, I want to see God's story. I don't want to live in a small story with just a great facility and good music and a little bit of haze and you got some great chemistry with one or two staff members. You know, you get a few friends at church that, that feed your business or your personal life or, you know, there's all of these things that all come together in this myopic sort of base of the mountain small story. I want to, I want to dream bigger than that. And I think sometimes as we grow, you know, numerically, look around this room real quick. Look, look around this room real quick. Do you realize some of you were here in November when there was like 43 people in this room? And you stuck it out. And some of you came back and you're like the prodigal son and we put our coat around you and there's all of that going on. We talked about that. But I think sometimes I just want to address before we get to this spot that I think, you know, success becomes the base of attendance. You're going to look at things growing. You're going to see more butts and seats, more nickels, noses. And you're going to think that, that things are successful, that we're moving through this narrative. A large gathering, does that make a good story? If we gather... 200 people in here? Have we made a dent in St. Paul? The average U.S. congregation gathers in a building that seats around 200. Only 65 attend church each week. That means half of all the churches have fewer than 65 people in their weekly worship service. In the last 20 years, the average attendance has been more than cut in half dropping in each fact study, the medium worship centers or service attendance among U.S. congregation has declined from 137 from the year 2000. 45% of the churches have fewer than 100 people. Now that, climb, that number has actually climbed to 65% of the churches in America have a few, fewer than 100 people. 
So by that definition, we're already successful. Attendance doesn't equal success in our story. We need something bigger than just attendance. You know what we need? I'm going to talk about it. It's one of our values. We talked a couple weeks ago about mission, about the power of the gospel. Last week, if you didn't catch the message on Ukraine, the end times, Matthew 23, just light stuff. (laughs) Gog and Magog, Ezekiel 38. You can watch that message online. I address directly this war that's going on. But I want to talk a little bit today about a kingdom imagination. You need to think kingdom. You need to live kingdom. Stop having a myopic view of the story in your perspective of where Summit is and where it's going. And start dreaming big in the kingdom. A kingdom imagination is going to give you a kingdom perspective, a personal kingdom story that has got eternal meaning for local impact. God, I just pray today as we look to your word that you would meet us where we're at in our perspective and in our default narrative. It would be transformed into a kingdom narrative. That we as a church would grab a hold of a kingdom imagination. That would be what fuels us. Not a small myopic view of the story that we default to. Give us the courage to dream big. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, as an artist, I'm going to go through this um, in a few different ways. But one of the ways is through a color palette. So if we're going to talk about a kingdom imagination, there are three primary colors to a kingdom imagination. Three of them. Now, this is my personal Uh, palette. I use this for most of my oil paintings. And if you want me to paint a picture of your dog, call somebody else. But I use this gray glass because gray is just a neutral color, allows you to mix colors, gives you a good tonal representation. But let's talk about this first color, which would be red. If you're going to have a kingdom imagination, you're going to need three primary colors to see it. Okay, the first one is red, and it's the parables of Jesus. Write this down. It's the parables of Jesus. Read, ingest, study, meditate, breathe the parables of Jesus. This revelation will feed your imagination. You only uncover what you dig for yourself. This is why Jesus taught in parables. He wants you to try to wrestle with it. That's why the disciples, when the lights turned on and they got it in a story form, they discovered this treasure. If I give you the answer to a question, whose answer is it? It's mine. I gave you the answer. If I lead you to a place where you uncover the answer, whose answer does it become? Yours. You only uncover what you dig for yourself, and a parable is hidden treasure. It engages your imagination. It breaks down the walls of just the way that we think. And and all of these different truths are revealed. It's beyond conventional wisdom. It's so much deeper than what you think. The the best way I can say this, and if you have your Bible, and and you should bring your Bible, uh, a paper Bible, or if you're wanting to be digital, go ahead and bring a digital Bible. But I guarantee you, you're doing your devotions on your iPhone, and 10 minutes later, you're playing Candy Crush. It happens to the best of us. Put on your Bible or in your notes, just write, picture, mirror, window. Whenever you read a, a parable of Jesus, what I like to do is think of it as a picture, as a mirror, and as a window. So you get a snapshot of what's going on. It's a picture you look at. You get to exegete scripture. You get to understand what Jesus is teaching. And then it's a mirror. It it's reflects back to you. It talks to you about what you're... Do you know that the Bible, especially the parables of Jesus, are a story you don't read, but it reads you? Do you know that the Bible is one of these... The, the only book, I will say succinctly that that interprets the reader 
So there's this picture of what's going on. There's a mirror of what's going on within. And then the picture gets knocked out and it's a frame and it becomes a window of how you see the world. And if you're going to have a kingdom imagination and your perspective is going to be overruled with God's perspective and story, you're going to have to have this primary color of Jesus' parables. It's going to have to shape how you think. It's going to have to shape how you act. It's going to have to shape how you respond. I'll give you... um, couple examples. I don't want to go into today, but church people can be a lot like the older brother in the story of the prodigal. Church people, religious people can be a lot like the older brother. Okay? It's just true. Um, Church growth, parable of the ten talents. The master wasn't impressed with fruitfulness. What he was concerned about was faithfulness. And there's a difference. There's a sermon. There's a life application there. It didn't matter what they worked or how long they worked. If they were faithful, they got paid the same. That's what's important to God, your faithfulness. Now, here, here's what I'll say about the people of St. Paul, about people in this church, through the lens of a kingdom imagination. This is where I want to spend the bulk of our time today in the book of Matthew, chapter 13, one of Jesus' famous and first parables. I want to just walk through this together with you. Now, it's his first major parable in Matthew 13. You should go there. If you haven't gone there, gone there already, it's the parable of the sower. He had just left Copernicum. He gets in a boat. And you can actually go to this place still today. It's, a, it's, it's actually kind of cool um, how it works, but it's the cove of the sower, and it actually exists. They think this is where Jesus gave this parable because the acoustics of this cove actually carry the human voice way further than you can normally do. Have you ever been on a lake late at night on a pontoon, 4th of July? We got 10,000 lakes, most of them are ponds. But if you've been out on like a lake and you can hear the person talking on their boat, about whatever they're talking about a long ways away. And Jesus was going to give this parable, and he just happens to know about sound waves and how they travel and the inner workings of the human ear and the little stirrup and the bone and all the science, because he made it. So he says, you know, the best way I'm going to do is I'm going to have to talk to all these people. So he gets up in this boat, and this is where he delivers this. And the audience that's there are a bunch of farmers, The truth is, is those people that are listening to this parable that we're going to get to by way of foundation, I'm just laying it down here, they had had farmed, sown, reaped, tilled the soil their entire life. It's like many of you who were born with a cell phone in your hand. And when we go out to dinner together, you still have that stupid cell phone in your hand. Does anybody know? I, I, I was Gen X. I grew up, and I don't even, we didn't even have the internet. And then we got net zero. I mean, it was dial-up, you know. We were the first ones to play video games, you know. I mean, there's all these. So I didn't know what that was like. Many of you do, but my point is, is if I talk about cell phones or an app store, you know what I'm talking about because you're all inundated with this. And when Jesus talks about farming, his entire audience is a group of farmers. See what I'm saying? He does this intentionally. He meets his audience where they're at and he brings them where they should be. This is what the parable does. Now, a little ancient farming 101. Many people wouldn't own land. They would actually be given the land a lease. They wouldn't own it. And they didn't have fencing like we do. So they had to create these little paths to get into, just remember that, they had to create paths to get to their section of land. A path through your garden wouldn't be something strange. These paths are how you got to your land that you didn't own, but that was leased or or given to you. After the fields were harvested, they were burned, and then the, the earth would become charred. 
and it would become cracked and then the animals would literally do what animals do and it would just be manure on top of this dark, hard, cracked ground. Ancient farmers were known as dry farmers. It's because they didn't have a lot of rain. Now, technically, this part of the world that Jesus is referencing here gets the same amount of rainfall in London, or as London does, it just gets it in half the days. So when it rains, it really rains. In fact, there's two rains. There's the former rains, and this is a really fun word, the latter rains. There's, there was two rains that happened where Jesus is, is giving this, and that's in November, December, and then like in March and April. So there's a former rain and a latter rain. And the rocks th that would be in these fields were actually left there. How many of you have ever seen a rock pile at a field that a farmer does? You know, our, our, uh, our property where we are at, in, in, uh, just south of here, um, we get the rocks out of an area that we want to garden. They actually left the rocks in the area where they want to garden or where they want to farm because the rocks created um, literally shade, shelter. They helped erosion. The, the water would pool around them. So you got this rocky ground. You got these paths. You got this rocky ground. Now, seeds were actually sown before the land was tilled. In ancient farming, you would go plant the ground before you would till the soil. What do you do in the spring when you're going to plant your garden? You get your rototiller out? No. You get your Kubota out with your 72-inch tiller. That's what I use for our small little plot of garden. We just grow tomatoes. No, I'm kidding. But you know what I'm talking about. Whether your garden's acres or it's a couple feet, you take and you turn the soil. You get all the weeds out. It's this beautifully, like, peat mossed, manure enriched patch of dirt, and then you go plant the garden. Ancient farming, completely opposite. They would spread the seed and then they would till the soil. So in that time period, after the well, former rains, when they would plant in November, December, because they'd have to wait for the ground to even get soft enough to till, it'd have to rain, all this stuff started growing. All these weeds, all these things, all these thorny bushes. And so you go spread seed, and you'd throw it wherever there is thorns, wherever there's ground, wherever there's rocks, wherever there's paths. Now let's go to our text. Are you ready? That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake in the large, the Sea of Galilee, the, the cove of the sower. And such a large crowd gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it. While all the people stood on the shore. And when he told them things in parables, saying, a farmer went out to sow a seed. And he was scattering the seed. Some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. And some fell on rocky places where it didn't have much soil. The path makes sense. The rocky soil makes sense. These aren't foreign things. This is all in this one area where they would farm, where it didn't have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow, but when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Verse 8. Still another seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Verse 9, whoever has ears, let him hear. Just a quick side note about verse 8. Um, Genesis 26, 12. Genesis 26, 12. Isaac is blessed. Um, and he plants crops in the land in the same year, and he rears a hundredfold because the Lord blessed him. A hundred is like an amazing a number. From an agricultural perspective, if you got a hundredfold and this time, you were the best farmer on the block. Not only that, if you knew the story of Jacob, which this audience did, that word a hundredfold, God must be blessing this. Because of what God did before with a hundredfold, he's going to do it again. Um, and then I just want to say something quickly. I don't want to get too bogged down in this. But the truth is, is 
the 160 and 30, I don't think that's a question of Jesus saying this is best, better, and good. Do you know what I'm saying? Like a hundredfold's the best, and then, well, 60's probably not as good, and if you yield 30 for the Lord, yeah, you're doing fine, but there's some room to grow. You know, I don't think Jesus is, is trying to pin the, the disciples or his audience in a, the, the trap of comparison because he deals with that in John 21 very differently than what he would. Why would he plant seeds of comparison here in Matthew 13 only to deal with it in John 21 if he needed to deal with it? He's not trying to make you feel like if you do 100 fold uh, or, or, or 60 or 30, you're somehow less than your brother or sister or another disciple or your a different soil. What I, what I think Jesus is actually saying here, how I would interpret it, Exodus 18, 21. You'll select from all the people as commanders of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. I think Jesus is speaking to your personal bandwidth. I think some of you have potential for a hundred and that's the best for you. And I think some of you are, have the potential for 60 and that's the best for you. I think some of you come from a pretty tough story and you know what's big for you? It's big for you. I think your individual story about fruitfulness, God sees and knows. Don't compare yourself to your brother or sister in this church because I was at the Target Center speaking in front of 12,000 people and you run a small group with two ladies that come faithfully on Wednesday nights. It's got nothing to do with who's better or who's bigger. It has to do with bandwidth. And sometimes God entrusts you with the 30 and then the 60 and then the thousands. I don't want to belabor this point, but I just know that I think it's about what kind of soil you are and don't ever look down on the soil if it's good soil. If you're producing 30, rest in that 30 Keep growing so you can do 60. And if 60 is the best, God knows. He knows. He doesn't, you're not going to stand before the Lord with me or anybody else here. He knows you by name. So he certainly knows your soil type. Let's go back through this real quick. Because there are four types of people in this room. There are four types of people in St. Paul. There's four types of people in your life. Now, luckily, Jesus actually tells us the meaning of this parable because the disciples go, what does that mean? Verse 19. Do you remember the path? When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, write that down, underline that, circle that in your Bible, does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed along the path. Verse 20, the seed on the rocky ground has someone who hears it and receives it with joy, but since they have no root, it only lasts a short time. When trouble, verse 21, or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. I've counseled many people in my short time as your lead shepherd um, in this already. There are some of you that are new to following Christ and things got weird or it went sideways or good things happened to bad people and you think that God is the, the, like the lineup of self-help books and everything's just going to be great. Well, if you're looking for a religion to be easy, don't choose Christianity. If you're looking for a path not to be persecuted, if you're looking for something not to be, well, a cross that you have to carry, burdens that he carries with you, I wouldn't suggest, as C.S. Lewis says, Christianity. Following Christ is going to cost you something. It's going to pay someone more. It's going to pay you more, but it's going to cost you something. It just is. And you know what? When storms come, who was in the boat when the storms came with the disciples, where was the location of the creator of the universe? On the shore or in the boat with them? See, Jesus isn't watching you in your storm. He's walking with you in your storm. He's the anchor in that 
persecution, in that trouble. And you, you expect God just to come in and, and swoop you out of it. He doesn't do that. You know what he does? He gets you through the shadow of the valley of death, not out of the shadow of the valley of death. So keep walking forward. Keep moving forward. There's something that God has. On the other side of this, he won't waste any of it. Not everything happens for a reason. Some things are just a, um, I, I, I want to say the word damn tragedy. They just are. They're horrible. But you know what? We serve a God that can make reasons for anything. And that's the truth. Jesus goes on to continue in verse 22. Seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of life and deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. And the seed falling on the good soil in verse 23 refers to someone who hears the word and understands it, who produces a crop yielding a hundred or sixty times what was sown. So there's four types of people. In this church, there's four types of people in St. Paul. Start getting a kingdom imagination for the people in your life. The first color in the kingdom of imagination, if you're going to see it all, is to understand the parables of Jesus and start looking at people in your life through the parables of Christ. Let me give you this one example. Here's where I want to land this point as we talk about the parable of the sower. Have you ever taken a Myers-Briggs test? Yeah? Myers-Briggs? ENFJ or something. Um, your disc profile. Do you know your disc profile? Do you know your color wheel? You're yellow and orange. Some of you are an otter and you're sanguine. Do you know about the Enneagram? Right? The Enneagram, you take the test and it dials up and you're something with the wing. I'm a seven with a six, I think, on a good day. Um, and then have you ever done a, a strength finder test where you can see how much you can bench press <laughs> at CrossFit, Jonathan? You know what I'm talking about? None of these things are bad. Some of them I will caution you as they're just flat out mysticism and pantheism. There's a lot of personality tests out there that will connect you to your horoscope and the order of the stars and the you better tread lightly there because I, 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 I would caution you on what you open yourself up to. But I have a question. Have you ever looked at the people in your life and the people in St. Paul or yourself as a soil type? Have you ever taken a soil test? Yes or no? Probably not. And see, what I want to say is we got to, as a people that gather here at the summit, stop thinking about our own perspective and about what Myers-Briggs says and about what the Enneagram says. We can use those things, but let's let those things be secondary to a parable of Christ. Let's those things support and give us other light, but let's let him be the light. And the question I have for you is what are your soil types in your life? Because the truth is, is you can cultivate them. You know, the path, they need understanding. What don't they understand? If you have a, someone in your life that's like the seed that's thrown on the rocky gr- or on the path, what don't they understand? We're cornered into a different way of thinking as people, and we got to garden our way out of this corner. I'm going to say it again. We're going to garden our way out of this corner. So what's the path? How do, how do we get someone who doesn't understand because they're the, the soil on the path? What don't they understand? What don't you understand? What soil type are there in your life? You're going to meet people that just don't understand. So cultivate that dirt. Some people, verse 20, need the foundation. So they need understanding on the path. They need foundation because they're on the rocky soil. You know what the best way is to build someone else's foundation when it comes to their own trials is how you respond to yours. We talked about that last week, about gas prices. Quit posting on your Facebook about gas prices when God knows what you need before you ask. There's provision, and it's not to belittle the need if you need gas money or whatever the case is, but do you hear what I'm telling you? There's this 
way of thinking, we get caught into, is it a six? Is it a nine? My story feeds it in rather than the kingdom imagination of the parable of Christ. Who is that in your life? How you respond to your own storms, that'll help their foundation. Maybe they need provision or perspective about their wealth. Is, is money all there is? Really? I mean, is that all there is? Think about the Russian oligarchs right now. How, who, what is an oligarch? <laughs> I see this word all over the place that they're seizing these oligarchs. Like, it sounds, it sounds like a bone in your body. What happened? It was bad. Yeah? I was at church softball. Broke my oligarch. <laughs> Broke it right off at the hip. But we know that there's more to this whole thing than just money, okay? And sometimes people get tied up and they receive the gospel or the, the seed goes forward and they actually physically need some provision. Do you, do you, we talked about this last week. If you have and you know someone who needs, you don't need to wait for me or Summit 363 or for somebody in this church, just smart a small group that starts meeting people's needs. You can just do it, okay? All right, let's move on. And the last is people just need a spark. They need the seed. They need the mission. There's four soil types in your life. Cultivate them to the good soil. Name people a soil type in your life and start to move them forward. Cultivate the soils with Jesus parables and your own Jesus story in your journey. Cultivate the soils with Jesus parables and your own Jesus story in your own journey. We, if we're going to have a kingdom of imagination, we got to have Jesus' parables shaping our life and our perspective. Here's the second primary color. Are you ready? This is local impact. I'm going to go through these last two a little bit quick because we'll get these another time. If you want to have a kingdom imagination, you got to think local. You got to have your life shaped by the parables of Christ and you got to think local. I don't want to pass through the internet. And if you're online, great. I'm glad you're joining us. And if you can't get here, we'll have an online church experience. But let's not deceive ourselves. This is, that's not church. It doesn't mean you have to gather. It's certainly helpful. But this online church thing isn't church. And so I, as your pastor, I'm not going to treat it like that. We'll have a word. We'll have some pre-recorded worship. But it's a form of delivery Okay, it's a Netflix episode. The church is a gathering of people that meet here at the summit. That's church. Or that meet during the week. Has nothing to do with Sunday. What are we doing Monday through Saturday should be more important with each other. You got to think local. Acts 1-8, Jerusalem, he calls us to be his witness when the Holy Spirit comes upon us to be his witness to Jerusalem. Write this down, Acts 1-8, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Okay? Not one or the other, but both. But there's an order. And if you want to have a kingdom of imagination, you got to think in order so you have order. What's the first one? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the other most parts of the earth. You know, I'm really proud of what this church has been able to do in missions all over the world. It's amazing how many missionaries we still support during COVID, didn't drop anybody. Continue to send and equip people. You know what breaks my heart? I'm really proud of the work that we've done missionally in the world. Can I just tell you what breaks my heart? Nobody on Grand Avenue knows we're here. Not a lot of kids in the Title I schools know who Summit is. You know, I think if you have the means, and many of us do, personally, I think it's often easy for us to give money than ourselves. Because requiring ourselves is going to be proximity. It's going to require local impact. It doesn't mean we're not going to continue to sow in the world, continue to launch. We've got retired missionaries sitting to my left and to my right that are here. We're not going to continue to support the uttermost parts of the earth. But look at me when I say this to you. 
as a church family, we will regain our voice in this city. And we will bring light and hope and darkness will hear us. Are you listening to me? On a level here, on a local level, we will make an impact here first and there, but we are going to live in order and start to sow money in order. We're going to start putting resources in order. We're going to start to go local. Local impact of a kingdom vision. I have a couple questions. Is it possible that Summit has a special assignment from God to fulfill that we have not yet even named locally? Is it possible that God is yearning to give us a fresh kingdom imagination that only we can display in this place and in this time? Is it possible that Summit has a voice so full of hope that we have to actually build another building? Now, I don't care how big this church is. It's got to be healthy. Big church, healthy church, healthy church first. But is it possible? I think it is. Let me ask you a couple questions on a local level. Have you thought about the divorce rates in our five zip codes? What about the mentorship programs that are struggling in the Title I schools? What about feeding the homeless people at Tent City once a month with guys in our church? We go and we bring our trailer over there and a couple of our grills and we cook brunch for them. What about the kids that we're trying to reach in a 20 block radius? What about the needs on Summit? You know, you can live in a million dollar house and you can be broke as a joke inside. You know, the difference between some people that have all the wealth and some people that have no wealth is nothing. They're both in poverty. This is different forms. Somebody's got a nicer watch. What are we doing with college students? There's colleges all over the place around here. What are we doing with them on a local level? What about crime prevention? How are we training our women in our church to walk and to exist in a city in St. Paul that's rapidly changing? When they go out on a date, do they know how to protect themselves? Do they know how to defend themselves? See, these are all questions that I'm having that I want you to start asking too. Because if I'm not the only one asking them and you start asking them with me, we just might get a kingdom imagination on a local level. It just might happen. I think it's possible. I, like I said, I don't want to pastor the internet. I don't want to pastor Minneapolis. I'm not discounting the need in Minneapolis, North Minneapolis especially. But you know what? I don't want to work I don't want Summit to work global and never love local. I don't want Summit just to be this amazing thing to the ends of the earth and we never do anything on our, on our block. That has to change. It has to shift. Our voice has to be reclaimed as a church in this city for such a time as this. All right. Dream with a kingdom imagination. First local then global. First local, then global. We do not one or the other. All right, last primary color. We're doing amazing. It's only 1.30. <laughs> last primary color. This personal kingdom calling. Ephesians 2.10 Write it down or look it up. Where God's handiwork created in what? Christ. To do what? Good works. The God has prepared in advance for us to do. Ephesians 2.10. Your handiwork, it's you, and there's a key word, prepared. It's not, and it doesn't read this, okay? Ephesians 2.10 doesn't say this. God's halfway work created in Christ Jesus to do okay works that God is hoping we get prepared for in advance to watch Pastor Eric do. Doesn't say that. If God is preparing, or if God prepared good works in advance for you to do, then, well, what's the conclusion? He must have or is preparing you 
to do them. If God's prepared good works for you to do, then, then who must do them? The staff? Bill? Pastor Bill? Me? Well, individually, yes, he's prepared good works for you to do. Get a hold of your personal calling, your personal passions. Shake it up. Quit watching church. This, is a, this isn't a spectator sport. This is full contact origami. <laughs> this is beautiful poetry in motion. That was good. <laughs> First Timothy 2, 5 and 6. Okay? There's one God, one mediator between God and humankind. Who is that? Jesus. First Timothy 2, 5 through 6 talks about one God, one mediator between God and humankind. It's Jesus. Hebrews 4.14 says that Jesus is what? The high priest. Jesus is this high priest, not me. He's the king of this church. He's the head of this church, not the pope. Stepping on some toes here. But I got news for you. That's one of the big things that the Reformation did was show us the reality that Christ is the mediator, not some human. Not another pastor online. Jesus is the high priest. Now, ready? Write this scripture verse down. I love this one. 1 Peter 2, 5. All of us in Christ have been redeemed to become priest yourself. We are a royal priesthood is what scripture says. We, you, me, us, are a royal priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ. The priesthood of all believers means this. Are you ready? You have a role to play. You have a role to play in what God is doing through this thing called summit in the kingdom of God in the city of St. Paul. I'm going to say that one more time until you get it. Eric, <coughs> okay, that, wow, that's way better. That, that's what came out. Um, that was funny. You have a role to play, you ready? You have a role to play, write this down, in what God is doing through this thing called summit in the kingdom in our city of St. Paul. Your ministry your personal calling is to not watch me do my ministry and my calling. If you want a kingdom of imagination, it's going to be a local and global, but in order, it's going to be our lives being lensed, our story through the parables of Christ, and you will have a role. God has equipped you. He's created you to do this with him as a royal priesthood. Now, here's the thing. God, I know, um, sees this, but I, I want you to know something when it comes to your local calling. I've, I've got a holy vision for many of you. I've got, a, I've got something that I see that God will use you in far maybe sometimes than you see. And I'm not going to go into it in detail. But believe me, if you want to just sit on the sideline, don't, don't ever meet with me. <laughs> if you want just to not be challenged in your personal calling and have me hand you a shovel, then just avoid me in the lobby. I want us to have a kingdom of imagination. Now, here's, here's the bet. You know what I'm going to do, right? So if you get these three things down, these three um, colors, I don't have white up here, which is a little bit of a challenge because white hues and tints, and I don't have a way to clean this. But I'm telling you, you can make every color in the beautiful spectrum 
Every single color starts to mold together and you can create a, an entire color wheel. You see all of the vibrance of everything with just getting the three colors of the kingdom imagination. Start looking at your life through the parables of Christ. Start looking and thinking local and global. Start to understand that you have a role in this. And I'm telling you, church, it's going to be a beautiful, colorful display for the city of St. Paul, for people in the 55105, and people to the ends of the earth. When we start playing with these colors, we can make any color on earth. And there's unity in that diversity. Don't need to be colorblind. We need to be color rich. But we got to start with the primary colors of Jesus' parables, of your personal calling, and a local impact. That's what it takes to have a kingdom imagination. So stop thinking in your perspective, in your default story, and I'm inviting you into a big one. It's the kingdom of God, and it's endless. God, I pray that today, as we look just at a f- one teaching, Jesus, one parable, I pray, Lord, that we would start to think about people in our life that are a soil. And if you're going to get baptized, you need to go right now because I'm going to baptize you. But God, we just thank you so much for this season that we're in. You're not going to waste any of it. Help us to see the people in our life, Lord, specifically. If there's one takeaway, church, if there's one takeaway I want you to grab from, from this message, is start seeing people in different soils and start asking the Holy Spirit to start to guide you to cultivate that soil. So in prayer right now, think of a person in your life. God, we pray for that person that's the rock path, that's the thorny, that the seed has been taken away. I I don't know where it is, God, where the seed has gone in in their life, and they're they're a soil type. Give us the courage to cultivate one another, to cultivate the garden of the people in their hearts, in St. Paul, in our lives, at our work, in our schools. God, help us to see people as you see them and give us the tools to garden them beyond their current state into good soil where the harvest takes place. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Why don't you stand with me right where you're at and sing this song as uh, Brian comes. And we'll, we're going to move into a baptism. Now, one thing you need to know real quick is next, well, on Easter, if you want to get baptized, we're going to have some other baptisms on Easter as well. So make sure you take advantage of that. If you're online and you want to do that, you need to meet with me. It's got a couple simple questions about your life. Just sing this chorus, and, and Brian, I know you're here, and I think you went out to change. When he comes back, just flag me down. And do, please don't leave. It's only 11.30. Football's over. I want you to cheer for this guy tonight. today. He's one of us. And he's making a big step in his faith. Just sing with me as Brian's changing. Our God is a lion, the lion of truth.
So church, if you've never been baptized, you need to know uh, that we do that here. We believe in that. It's an amazing public declaration of your faith. Now, I will say this, many of you have been baptized as an infant, and that was amazing. That was your parents' dedication. And there's nothing wrong with that. If you wanna make that public declaration, you can get baptized twice. And we'll walk with you and journey with you in that. You don't do this for salvation, you do this because you're saved. You don't go to a cabinet, take an aspirin to get a headache. You go to a cabinet and you take an aspirin because you have a headache. You do this because you're saved. And do I think it's essential to following Christ? Yes. You cannot separate being baptized post-conversion. It is essential for your journey. For your salvation, I'll leave that up to God. But for your journey as a Christ follower, this is the Super Bowl. This is an amazing moment. So there's a guy in this church who's been journeying through a lot, and I took the electric thing out so he doesn't die because I love him dearly. But uh, Brian Burr, would you come up here with us? Put your hands together for Brian as he comes. I got you. Uh, Brian, you know, you, you've been through a bunch. And Jody, we're still getting through the bunch. But I'm not going to quit. I'm the two of you. So don't quit on each other. There's nothing that you can't get through with Christ helping you get through. We're living proof of that. Danielle and I have been married for 21 years and it should have ended 21 years ago. But the grace of God, we both go. So Brian, um, I gotta ask you a question. Check, check. Is Christ something you believe in your head or you know in your heart? In my heart. Amen. Is uh, this moment where you are now following Jesus, are you a sinner? No. No, you're not a sinner. You're a son. You may sin, you may fall short, but that's not your identity. That's the rear view mirror windshield says that you were bought and paid with the price. No height, no debt, no any other thing can separate you from the love of God. And in him you're new. You, you've got the floor for a few minutes, but I'm going to give you this microphone and I want you just to share with that woman right there and with all of us here what God has been doing in your life. Because I've seen it, I've watched it. There's other men in this church that have seen it. Bring them up to speed on what God's been doing in you. I've always had um, God in my heart, or in my life. I was raised that way. I was baptized by my parents. But um, I always thought, going through life, I did the right things and had told parents. I was wrong. Uh, God saw that two years ago he saved me he made my heart and for that I thank you and I thank my wife I thank my daughter for what is standing by me I love you very much And you can take your shoes off. It's warm-ish. I want you to know something. God's got his second chances. And I'm going to keep speaking to the man that you're becoming, the one you were. Crazy enough to believe 
that you're good soil. And I pray that your love of the outdoors, hunting, fishing, shooting guns, would be a common thread of humanity that you would extend like a net to men in this church. There are guys in this church who want to walk with you out into that ice and catch those fish and journey in the way of the woods and the way of the Christ hand in hand. And I'm going to tell you something. There's a ministry that you've longed for at Summit when it comes to how we impact men's life specifically to people that are looking for what you're looking for when it comes to connection when it comes to serving one another when it comes to all those things and I'm going to tell you today there are other men that are in this church that want to walk with you but you lead them too there's a lot of other Brian's out there that need this story I'm proud of you it's been an honor to be your pastor for just a couple months and years and watch what God's doing in your life. There's a lot ahead of you too. Give me that tape. So, Brian Burr, because of your public declaration and your personal acceptance and confession is Christ, Jesus, your Savior. I'm going to baptize you right now in front of these witnesses and a cloud of witnesses in heaven. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, you're going to go down and you're going to come up. And this symbolizes this newness that's been in you for the last months and will continue through you to your life. You are not who you were. You are who he's making you. The greatest hunt that you've ever been on is for the peace of your home. That's the trophy. Go we'll get it. Baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So God, we thank you for this life and the lives that are to come. We ask God that you would continue to illuminate in our hearts the soils that people have in theirs. Give us the opportunity to have a kingdom imagination through your life and through your parables, Jesus. Help us to see the world and to see ourselves. Give us the ability to cultivate the soils that are in our own hearts with one another, but in the people that we run into every day. What soil tarp? type are they and how do we bring them to a place God with your partnership by your Holy Spirit where they become a good soil God give us this local impact in this city and the world God I pray for every person in these movie chairs I pray Lord that they would stop looking to the left or to the right for something to drop out of the sky but God they would grab a hold of their personal calling and their passions would intersect here at this church so that we can be light they can live this out God I pray for this marriage that's in front of us here in the Burr family God continue to do what you do we pray for the roots that have been tied up, continue to pull them out, Jesus. Make a way. 
much more from this birth family. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody says, amen. Easter Sunday, if you want to get baptized, talk to me. Have a great week. Thanks for coming to church today.